Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and my guest today has had the same job since 1981. Go figure. <laughs> How is that even possible? Rick Matson's worked for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship since 1981, and last week he was at the University of Montana, did a very interesting session for a bunch of grad student students, and they talked about how to answer hard questions, and he answered hard questions. So that's the topic today. Rick, nice to have you here. Hi, Bill. Uh, good to see you. Good to be here. Yeah. So were you training how to answer hard questions or just taking them? <laughs> I should have done more show prep. <laughs> it was both. Uh, the Graduate Fellowship at the University of Montana meets Wednesday nights. They have a little meal. I enjoyed that with, I don't know, maybe 15 or so graduate students. And the topic they gave me was, our friends have hard questions and they have objections What's a general methodology for responding to those hard questions? Mm-hmm. And yes, we will do some specific examples, but let's just zoom out and do a general method, a kind of a how-to of even, you know, what are the steps you would go through to answer those hard questions? All right. Well, let's do it. Okay. Good. Zoom out. <laughs> zoom out. <laughs> zoom out, Rick. Give well, I have a, some give suggestions. Give us a picture. Good. Yes. You've got notes, which is I have very encouraging here. for me. Yeah. I will read them slowly and boringly. <laughs> no, but just go ahead. <laughs> Well, to to summarize, here's four words that I'd like people to think about. One is slow. Secondly, listen. Thirdly, respond. Fourth is Jesus. Meaning, slow down. When people have hard questions and come at us, and sometimes they come at us hard with strong feelings and emotions, they have strong opinions. And my first impulse then, because I've done this a lot, is just slow things down. Don't try to jump into answer mode right away. Don't think that you have to be the expert defending God in the next 30 seconds, 60 seconds, five minutes. Slow things down. This is usually, hopefully, about a relationship and not just becoming Encyclopedia Britannica to them right. on a religious topic. And then secondly, and I'll go through these uh, more thoroughly, but the second thing, after you slow down, then make sure you listen to what they say. And then thirdly, at, at some point, you want to respond to their objection and question. Don't keep putting it off. Uh, if they want to actually talk about the issues, then let's talk about the issues. That's fine, and to the best of our ability. And then fourthly, I use the word Jesus, and that means everything that we say Everything that we offer and suggest in the way of an apologetic eventually, maybe not immediately, but eventually funnels back to Jesus, the claims of Jesus, the life of Jesus, his teaching, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection. Everything eventually has to get back to that. To me, that's how you do apologetics in the long run. In other words, that's how you defend the faith in the long run. Philosophical concepts are great. I do that. Theological concepts are great. I do that, too. There's nothing wrong with those things. Eventually, they have to point to Jesus. So those things were slow down, listen, respond, and then Jesus. In other words, point people to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And That's I have right. a few thoughts about those different things. But, yeah, do you have an no, no, initial? It's, it's very helpful because I, I think once anybody comes at you, you have to learn how to just say, look, I don't need to get caught up in this emotional energy right now. right. Because I, I feel defensive or I feel like I, I'm getting attacked a little bit and I don't have to go there. No, that's right. So if I slow down, yes, then I, I'm, I have a little bit um, more skin in the game. Exactly. I'm not going to get flooded and say something stupid. And I mean, I might say that anyway because <laughs> right. that's kind that's of okay. what I, yeah. I have a tendency of doing once in a while. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, slowing down honors the person. It honors the importance of the topics. And it says, people have been working on this, people of good faith, philosophers, theologians, and lay people have been working on most of these issues for hundreds of years, all the way back to the time of Christ, and in many cases, back to the Old Testament and to the early philosophical period of the Socratics. And 
So we're not going to solve it here in the next five or ten minutes, but we can draw from those resources. We can stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. We don't have to invent solutions here. And for a thoughtful apologist, a thoughtful layperson who wants to be an apologist at some level, you can do your research and then get back to the person. Or if you've already studied up on some of these issues, you can go right into them there. But I think the idea of slowing down and making this a conversation and not just a uh, Q&A, just, not just you ask and I respond, you ask and I respond, taking it to more of the relational level, I think is more the way of Christ in this. Mm-hmm. Now, Rick, I would imagine when you have conversations with people, there are topics that you will die on. Yeah. Topics you will more vigorously defend, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. And others you, you'll go, well, we can have a discussion about that. Yeah. Well, when it comes to the resurrection, I'm not going to lay out the three views that no, evangelical no, scholars no hold the resurrection. There's no need for that. That's one of the central tenets of the faith, and we should stand firm on that or the miracles of Christ, or the crucifixion, or the Trinity. Yeah, we could talk about how the doctrine of the Trinity was developed, but it would take a lot (laughs) to overthrow the doctrine of the Trinity after these hundreds of years. But yeah, if a a lesser, yeah, lesser maybe isn't quite the right word, but maybe secondary issues such as exactly how we're going to perform baptism or exactly what we believe about the gifts of the Spirit or exactly what we think about the issues surrounding creation, evolution, the age of the earth, right. exactly which view of the end times we hold. Those are important. I'm not saying they're like, oh, no big deal. I think they are a big deal. But they are issues, secondary issues, on which people of good faith have disagreed, brought the pros and cons. You have strong theological and philosophical arguments on two or three sides of those issues, and then you might be in for a longer conversation. Mm -hmm. Rick Matson is my guest. If you just joined us, he's giving us a little bit of an an overview on what to keep in mind when answering hard questions. Rick, let's review it one more time because there's people just climbing (laughs) in their car right now. Yes. And they don't want to feel like they're missing. Yeah. Well, the four words I'd like people to focus on are slow for slow down. Slow down. Listen Respond to the question as directly and as thoroughly as you can in a conversational and caring way. In other words, answer the question yes, they're asking. Yes, yeah. Don't duck, don't avoid, okay. don't evade. Yep. Yes. And then fourth, the fourth word is Jesus, meaning eventually we point people toward Jesus. Every apologetic that we engage in, no matter the topic, eventually gets back to the person, life, identity, death and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. When we get to the third one, Rick, which says answer the question— Counsel us as to what happens when we draw a blank. (laughs) Well, then I say, hey, I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, that's honest. (laughs) Yeah, that's honest because this is a human and humane relationship we're working on here, a journey together. If they ask me something about fishing or golf or some hobby I have and I go, oh, I'm just drawing a blank on that famous fisherman or that famous golfer right now. And so then I would just admit that. And since this is, yeah, it's an important topic but it's still a human conversation, and so I would do the same thing. I would just admit, oh, I'm drawing a blank on that right now. I can't remember this third century uh, theologian that, right. that uh, uh, commented on this, or I can't remember what my pastor mentioned uh, Sunday morning in his sermon about this, but I'd love to go back and look it up, and uh, maybe I can get back to you later this afternoon, yeah. or tomorrow morning, let's have coffee. Yeah. And then I'll be a little bit more prepped up on this uh, topic. And that's part of slowing down. Like, I'm not in a hurry. Right. This is in God's hands. This isn't really all on my shoulders. But I do want to be a faithful, caring, and honest instrument of God. And that means slowing down and listening to the other person. And I have a few more comments about those four words. But Yeah. What did you have for lunch today? (laughs) What did I have for lunch today? This is a cognitive test. I want to see. Yes. You you said, I can't remember this. I can't remember that. So (laughs) remember what you had for lunch? It was something about chicken. It was something about my house. the chicken group? Yeah. (laughs) And uh, there was some kind of uh, really good hot dish that was thrown in on there. Some leftovers from my wife. Okay. Well, that's fair. Yeah. All right. Let's go back to your four words and some added extras. Yeah. Yeah. Some extras here. Uh, Slow down. I think that means be ready for the long haul. And especially these days, the apologetic issues, meaning the objections people have, the questions they ask, are more cultural apologetics and hot-button issues 
around gender, sexuality, hypocrisy in the church, colonialism, imperialism, race. I mean, all justice issues, those are more than like, oh, I've got three quick responses to every one of those. It's more, okay, settle down, get in this for the long haul, hear the other person's story, draw them out, ask questions. Don't be in a rush to give answers. At some point, we need to directly address questions. I'm not saying be evasive, but I am saying as we slow down, we want to hear, well, what's the story behind the question? Mm, like now, wh- why are you really concerned about that right now? Because I am too. Mm-hmm. We're both concerned about it. And if we're going to be on a little bit of a journey together here as partners in this dialogue, I just want to hear kind of where you're coming from right now. And they might have some church hurt or they might have some misconceptions about Christianity. They might be well-informed or misinformed. I don't know in advance, but I want to know. And that's what I mean by slowing things down and don't feel the pressure to give an answer right away. Mm -hmm. Sounds very relational building. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, this is Jesus extending the conversation with the woman at the well in John 4. Jesus, yes, he does have answers, but there's a pretty long and winding road here, Uh, a long and winding conversation in which Jesus deposits certain nuggets that really make this conversation come alive. But I don't know, he doesn't seem to be in any hurry to get there. And just the idea that he, as this Jewish rabbi, is talking to this woman who is a Samaritan, you know, overcoming these barriers, the whole thing is elongated in a way that I think gives honor to who she is as a person and doesn't just say, oh, yeah, of course, I'm God. I'm the answer man. What do you need to know? I'll give it to you in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do that. And I think the relationality there is a good object lesson for us. Mm -hmm. Rick Manson is my guest. We're talking about how to answer hard questions, and we've got a couple of uh, questions we're going to try to pick at in this uh, hour. If you have uh, a hard question that you have encountered, I'd just love to hear what it was. You can text it over, 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. So the four, again, are of slow down. Slow down. Listen. Listen. Respond. respond, Don't evade. Yes. And then point, Jesus is the fourth word, point them to Jesus. I was trying to come up with some clever acronym for this, S-L-R-J. Yeah. Couldn't come up with anything. No. Yeah. (laughs) Smart Lions Read Journals, S-L-R-J. Smart Lions Read Journals. That doesn't really have that great of a ring either. No, it really doesn't. No, no. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You being a man of the stage, you would would know this, and that doesn't quite make it. That's not ringing the bell. (laughs) Wyatt? <laughs> well, Keep, working Wyatt. Keep working, yes. Keep working, oh, yes. Rick. We love you, Rick. No, yes. that actually does work. Smart Lions Read Journals. Look at I already remembered it. Okay. S-L-R-J, meaning slow down, listen, respond, and Jesus. Yeah. But could I talk about the second one here, listen? Uh, of course. Yeah, I, I want to suggest to people that we listen in stereo, that we come into a conversation, and when someone has an objection, a question whether they're being polite or impolite about it, as sometimes the case may be, that we listen in stereo. We've got one ear on the Holy Spirit. We've got one ear on this fine person in front of us made in the image of God that we really want to listen to and talk about the lost art of listening in our culture. When people feel heard, it's a different experience for them in this culture, in this noisy, static-filled, instant culture. No one feels listened to anymore. And if we do a good job of that, by listening carefully and drawing them out and asking questions, that will really be a different experience for them, and we can move the relationship forward. But I've also got the other ear uh, heavenward. I've got the other ear on the Holy Spirit. Lord, what are you saying to me right now? What do you want me to communicate in this relationship right now? Is it my time to just care and empathize, or do you really want me to deliver whatever answers might be at my disposal right now? Mm. I don't know in advance. And, you know, some of us are better at some things than others. Some some of us are super gifted in empathy and mercy, others in the apologetic. But whatever it might be, I think we need to listen to God and respond to what he might be nudging us, prompting us to do in these conversations as best we can. And I'll say this, that as much as I – it sounds so ideal to just respond to the nudges and promptings of the Holy Spirit – I don't always know what the Holy Spirit is saying, you know. I don't always get it right. The Holy Spirit might be communicating 
clearly, and I might have some blockage on my end. But anyway, as best I can, hear his voice and respond to what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Do you have little battles in your head once in a while with a message that you feel might be coming from the Holy Spirit? And you think to yourself, wow, I think I just got a message from the Holy Spirit. Yes. And then there's a part of you that says, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Yes. I don't know about that. I do have that dialogue in my head. Not just me. (laughs) Yeah. And then if I really think it's something from God and it's a little bit off track from what we've been going, I might say, hey, could I change the subject slightly? Kind of been feeling this nudge. It seems like it might be from God. I don't know. I'm not positive, but could I just run it by you? Mm -hmm. So you're sort of asking permission if you can go there. And if the other person says, yeah, go ahead. Then I might say, yeah, well, I think I'm getting this image or I'm getting this message. Just want to see if it resonates with you. Mm-hmm. Rick Manton is my guest. We are talking about hard questions today. And if uh, you uh, have had someone give you a really hard question and you thought, I don't know what to do with this one. And if you want to send it over, we'd love to see what it is and maybe even discuss it. 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner? And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. Hard questions that we're talking about today. Rick Matson is my guest. He worked, uh, has been working for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship since 1981. <laughs> Seems like a long time, Rick. <laughs> See this gray hair? Every yeah. one of it is earned. Yes, indeed. <laughs> How many years is that? You, I can't do the math. 43, going what? on 44, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. A servant. You love yeah. this too, don't you? I'm not tired of college students. I'm not tired of graduate students, faculty. It's yeah. it's a good life. And you're not tired of radio. I'm not tired of <laughs> hanging with you and Wyatt. This, Thank you for inviting me. This is a, this is a good team, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hard questions. Uh, maybe we can talk about things like why Rick is... Why do you keep saying Christianity is the only way? Come on. <laughs> I've got some really lovely friends, and they uh, are not Christians, but all roads lead to heaven. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just uh, I just say it because I'm the smartest guy in the room. Just kidding. <laughs> no. I simply follow the claims of Christ. If Jesus says that Christianity is the way and the truth and the life, Christianity meaning faith in him, and that he's the pathway back to God, really, who am I to argue with that? Now, if Jesus isn't the revealed, unique Son of God as depicted to us in the four Gospels, then everything is up for grabs. If the resurrection didn't happen, everything is up for grabs. But if Jesus' teaching is true, if his miracles happened, if his death occurred, if his resurrection was a fact of history— then we all need to listen to him and his claims. So I'm not the one really making the claim. I'm the amateur really here who believes uh, Jesus, who is the Lord, and he's the one making the claim. So if he says that Christianity is the only pathway to God, then it would actually be more arrogant for me to disagree with him than to kind of take this whole thing on my shoulders. I mean, it's such an outrageous claim. It is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If I sent you a text and I said, hey, Rick, I bought you a brand new Cadillac. You should come pick it up. Yeah. It's so outrageous, you would have to examine to find out if I'm telling the truth or not. Yeah, yeah. I would check that out. You would check that out. There's a lot at stake here. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I thought, well, maybe Bill is wrong or it's the wrong Rick or it's, he has a son named Rick that he bought a Cadillac, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I would follow through. You would follow through? Yes. Because the claim yes. is so outrageous. It is. It is so So Jesus outrageous. says, I am the way, yeah. the truth, the life. Why don't yes. you want to examine the evidence to yeah. see if it's true? Yeah. At one of the campuses I served just recently, this young woman, I'll just call her Sarah. That's not her real name. But anyway, Sarah had gone overseas she had studied, she'd lived in a home of a 
another family over there of another religion, and she was really struck with how sincere and devout they were, and she came home with many doubts about her own Christian faith. So I had about 90 minutes with her one day just in the student center, and we talked back and forth, and really what it gets down to, we talked about the claims of Christ, and are you going to believe those or not? And do we have good reasons for thinking that they are true? Uh, And so... uh, after 90 minutes, I think she really made some progress in her thinking that the, the kind of the default position of our culture is that, well, all the religions are saying the same thing uh, just under different brand names. <laughs> right. You know, sure. we're all just talking about love and God and so forth. And it has, happens to be called Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or Christianity. And it's really all kind of saying the same thing. Well, probably the one thing that of all those positions that can't be true is that they're all true. Because all of these different views, they contradict each other. And if you say, well, they're just all kind of true, maybe in ways we don't understand, then you're saying contradictions don't matter. But of course, contradictions always matter. And if contradictions matter, then the one position here that can't be true is that they're all true. Mm-hmm. And now, once, once that is off the table, then you can go through the different religions and say, well, which of these is true? Or maybe it's atheism that's true. But if we believe the claims of Christ, then it's Christianity. Rick, do you find it challenging if someone has subscribed to a certain uh, faith-based denomination and it turns out that they are entirely wrong uh, because it's not a a Christian-based denomination? It's it's some weird... Yeah, cultic. Cultic thing. But they've been in it for 40 years. Yeah. And you have to say, I guess the last 40 years has been a mistake. (laughs) And that is hard to do for people. Yeah. Well, if they really want to talk about the issues uh, directly, which they usually don't, then you can just get right back into the claims of Christ and the claims of the historic church to have known Christ and presented him to us. Secondly, and more likely, is this is going to be a longer conversation, and we're going to start reading the ancient texts together. Oh, I like that. So now we start reading the Gospel of John together or the Gospel of Mark together. Or if they have something from their tradition that we can read together, I'll go ahead and do that. So another religion, and, and, and kind of a near-miss Christianity. And I don't want to name any names, but uh, let's read their literature and we'll read our literature and just see what the Lord might do. I sure. think that's a fair way to go do our business. Yeah, I like that. Here's a question that came in from some chatter we had before the break, Rick okay. Madsen. How do you differentiate between your thoughts based on your belief in God and the Bible versus the Holy Spirit directly prompting you somehow? Yeah. And does it actually matter? Yeah, I think it does matter, and, and I, don't, I don't always get it right. But one thing I would suggest to folks is that the more you practice it, the more you probably are going to get it right. Because listening is connected to obedience, The more we obey what we think God might be saying, the more I believe he is going to honor our choices and the more he's going to speak to us and the more he's going to uh, honor, yeah, then the more he's going to say, well, last time this person, they weren't even sure it was me, but they obeyed. That's my son. That's my daughter doing that the best they can. And I think that's going to open up the lines of communication between us and the Lord evermore. And then secondly, the more we are steeped in scripture and prayer, the more we're going to already recognize God's voice for what it is. So if I'm steeped in the written word, I'm more likely to accurately hear these little, well, they're not verbal, but they're kind of these uh, nonverbal prompts in our heart, in our conscience. And we'll recognize that as the voice of God because it's so closely tied to the voice of God in scripture and the voice of God in Bible study that we do in our churches and the voice of God that we hear through listening to sermons in our churches. We're accustomed to God and his ways and his paths. And so when we hear a prompt, we'll know if it accords with God's voice in scripture and then we can choose to obey or not. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have conversations about the energy that is required or the effort that's needed to be sharp when it comes to evangelism or apologetics? I mean, if a friend of mine called and said, hey, do you want to meet at 
I get off work at nine. You want to meet at nine thirty and talk about <laughs> God? It's like no. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to be sound asleep. Exactly. I'm watching the news. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, but there's there's a certain amount of margin you have each day. Yeah. Uh, if you work a full time job. Yeah. But and to answer your question, I mean, to answer my own question, <laughs> I would I would reschedule that nine thirty. Yeah, I would meeting. Too. I'd find a new time. Yes. I wouldn't avoid them altogether. I'd, right. I'd welcome it. Uh, yes. But. There are it. There is certain amounts of energy you need to be an effective evangelist. Yes. If we see in the Gospels that Jesus was called to a certain, dare I say, limited ministry, he didn't do everything all the time. That's true. He took time off. He went to pray. Uh, he said, my hour has not yet come. I have things to do. But when my hour has come, I'll be gone. It was only, what, two and a half years, give or take. And so... Jesus' ministry had limitations on it. Our ministry should have limitations on it as well. And when we invest ourselves properly in the things the Lord has given us, then it's actually improper to go beyond what he's given us to do. I like that. And so, uh, and we have to determine that over time through trial and error, by reading scripture, by consulting the wisdom of friends and so forth. But the older we get, I think the more we understand our calling, the more we understand our just physical rhythms and limitations. And if we pay attention to those, I think we're going to be in much better shape than if we just say, well, someone called, boom, I'm gone. Right. And then your life uh, becomes a mess and you end up not being the witness that you subscribe to. Mm -hmm. Rick Madsen is my guest. Here's a question, Rick. How do we know what God's plan or will is for our life? Besides doing good and loving others to the glory of God, how, what, or when might God intervene within our everyday life? Or what does he allow to play out? Yeah. Yeah, we work a lot on this question with especially our younger staff in InterVarsity and with our student leaders. Like, what is God's plan for your life? And we don't know in advance, but we look at things like, what are you naturally gifted in? How do, how did the Lord make you in your natural gifts and abilities that you were born with? Secondly, uh, what are your spiritual gifts? And there's some wonderful tests out there that you can take to help determine your spiritual gifts. And especially if you take those tests in community with people that know you well and can give input into that. And then what are the skills that you've acquired along the way? What opportunities has God given you either to study or to acquire a skill, maybe in public speaking or counseling or service or whatever it might be? And then fourthly, what are the uh, opportunities in front of you? <laughs> Uh, is it blue sky or are you kind of tied down to a location? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a kind of logistical logic that I don't think we should always listen to, but I think it at least gets factored in. And then fifthly, am I on number five? Anyway, we'll go with number five. In general, what does the scripture teach about how I'm supposed to be living my life? And sometimes that's a little bit more generalized and doesn't give us particular guidance, but I would never want to do anything that's outside of the voice of God in Scripture. So that's always a guiding principle right there. And then, um, yeah, I think those are probably the main things we work on. There's probably a couple I'm not thinking of. But I think part of this, Bill, is know thyself. Do we really have the tools to help our lay people in churches and even our clergy to really know ourselves well so that we would know what kinds of opportunities we should even respond to possibly. So for me, I should probably not respond to something in a professional basketball management. Yeah. <laughs> but what about something? No team wants you by the way. <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. What about something in a church that has to do with philosophy or theology or Bible or church history, something along those lines? That's just a general life calling that I have. Mm -hmm. Now you've got many lanes of opportunity within that general calling. And even if you don't get the the perfect lane, you get a lane right next door to the center of God's will. I don't know. I think some of that talk is kind of overblown. The Lord can use me in the next lane just as well as he can use me in this lane, as long as I'm in my general calling. I think that's, that's the main thing. That's true. I like that. Be comfortable in your own skin. Know exactly. what God has gifted you to do, and then go do it. Bill, you be you, I'll be me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wyatt. Wyatt will be Wyatt. Wyatt will be Wyatt. I'll yeah. keep doing me. Keep yeah, doing me. I like that. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break and be back. If we're talking to Rick Matson today about answering hard questions, if you've had a hard question and you didn't know really how to answer it and you want to share it with us, we'd love to see it. 877-933-2484.
It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Hey. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Welcome to the afternoon show, and I have Rick Matson here in the studio. We're talking about how to answer hard questions. In the beginning of the hour, he kind of laid out a formula. I like that. <laughs> and it was uh, yeah, slow down. Slow for slow down. Slow. Listen, Listen in stereo. Yes, in stereo. Third word is respond yeah, man. directly to the question. the question. Don't be evasive. Answer the question as, as you're able. As you know? you're able. Yeah. And then fourthly, the fourth word is Jesus. In other words, eventually, at some point in the conversation, be it short or many weeks and months, point them to Jesus. That's our end point here. So slow, listen, respond. Jesus, smart lions read journals. We got another one, too. <laughs> Let's see. S-L-R-J. Okay. Another listener chimed in with silent lions rest jaws. <laughs> <laughs> That's an improvement on what I have. Well, thank you, Michael, for that. But I don't know if I'm going to go with it or not. <laughs> All right, Rick Manson, here's a hard question. Okay. Let's talk about hypocrisy in the church. Yeah. I was harmed in my yeah. church. Uh, you know? Because of the hypocrisy. Yeah. You call yourself a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, the first thing I want to do is just hear their story and empathize. I just want to say, hey, I'm really sorry that happened. Could you just share with me a bit about how that went down and then how it made you feel and and what were people saying? And, I mean, did they give you a chance to respond or did you feel like you had to leave? And and was that done with all of Christianity or was it just that church maybe? Like, I've been to a doctor's office and didn't have a good experience there, so I switched doctors, and, you know, that really helped. But is that applicable to your situation, mm-hmm. or is it more universal for you right now? And um, so maybe being a little bit more direct than I would, I, I, I just want to listen to this person's story. Church hurt is often a long-term malady. People don't get over it very fast. And then, especially if their church hurt is reinforced by stereotypes in the media or negative images of Christians in the media. And (laughs) so, you know, buckle down, be in it for the long haul, I would say. But I also want to say that uh, uh, Christians often ignore or change the clear teaching of Jesus, and then they do bad things. So it's not so much that Jesus and Christianity, here's the problem. It's that sinners who have misused, mishandled the teachings of Jesus. That's usually the problem. It's not the sinless Jesus. It's the sinful people who embrace him that make mistakes. And so at some point I might want to say, well, I'm really sorry that that pastor said that or that that church leader implied that or insulted you. You know, I'm really sorry that happened. I wasn't there, but kind of on behalf of the church, uh, I'll do what I can to reconcile and to acknowledge harm and hear their story. And then eventually I want to just keep gently pointing them back. Well, have you talked to Jesus about this? Do you still believe in Jesus? Could you go back and talk with him about this and make your complaint to him? I think he can take these kind of complaints, you know, and see how he might respond to that. And then, okay, I'm compacting a very long oh, conversation I, I here see this. Yeah. into a minute or two. Right. And then eventually, could we reread the stories of Jesus and see how he handles the objections and the problems of broken people, those who are marginalized in that society? Just like you're feeling marginalized right now, maybe not from society, but you're feeling marginalized from the church. Let's see how the Jesus of Scripture might reach out to you and how he reached out to the tax collectors and the Samaritans and other people of his day. Is that possible for you? Okay, I just did a, what, two or three minute little thing there that Mm -hmm. probably might take, what, a month or two or a year of conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm condensing it. But I think moving in that direction is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Rick, I have had conversations and I've heard people talk about their reception they get when they look at a new church. And they will sometimes say, well, I just didn't feel like anybody noticed me or reached out to me. And then on the other side of the coin, there's some people that want to walk into a church and kind of be left alone and and see what it's like. Uh, there's always seems to be a fine line between uh, connecting to people, giving them space, and then at what point 
does a person have a responsibility to reach their hand across the aisle and say, hey, I'm Bill. Yes. And introduce yourself to someone. Yes. <laughs> you know, that that's a very complicated topic that is, for me. Yeah. I think the priority in this transaction is friendly churches. Step one, the lead card here, the onus is on churches to be friendly. That's step one. That, that's a non-negotiable. And then secondly, yes, people do have responsibility. But if step one isn't being taken care of, if we are not embodying the friendliness, the fellowship of Christ and his spirit and and including people, then even a person who does take some uh, responsibility for their own presence at a church mm-hmm. and reaches out, then they're not going to get anywhere. So the onus is on us in the church, and then we can hope and pray for some responsibility on the other side. And then at where I go, at Grace Church Roseville, we just kind of have a habit of, okay, now talk with someone you don't know after the service. And we've been doing that for years, and it's amazing the number of people who are in the church because they say, oh, yeah, such and such talked to me after a service. Really? Is that why you're here? Yeah, pretty much. And then I grew to love the other elements of the church. And I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but that's one thing I really like about our church. But I think in that conversation after the service, we who are sensitive churchgoers can kind of feel a person out. Some people don't want to be talked to. Okay, leave them alone. You can tell. And some people are just shy and want to be drawn out. And we need sensitivity uh, to go there and to figure that out. Mm-hmm. I traveled for so many years, Rick, so and I would always find myself looking for, you know, churches and discovering churches. And I'd go in and I always had fun because I would, I would walk in, sit down, and I would start shaking people's hands. And their response to me is, oh, well, how long have you been going here? <laughs> I said, I don't know, five minutes? Five minutes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was always yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. So here's a question. Uh, what does the scripture, the meek shall inherit the earth mean? Well, I'm not recently studied up on that passage okay. per se, but zooming out, Christ does call us to be humble in front of him. We are humble worshipers. And uh, it, it takes setting aside of one's pride to even submit to the Lordship of Christ. And when you submit to the Lordship of Christ and come to him in faith and love, there is a there is a kind of humility about that. There's an embarrassment about your former life of sin and your desire to be in Christ. And that takes a certain humility. And then the promises of the gospel then kick in and the meek, yes, shall inherit the earth, the new heaven and the new earth and the heaven and all that comes with it in the end times and beyond is for those who are in Christ. So that's a bit of a zoom out, even yeah. if I'm not doing a Greek verb parsing here. That's fine. But when you yeah. see inherit the earth, that really means that believers will be part of the, the new yes, heavens the new, and the new yes, earth. Yes, yes. The, the, the end of time, the day of the Lord, a lot of these concepts run together in Scripture. And you can you can separate them for the point of, for the purposes of discussion, but eventually they kind of run together in this a holistic way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I think I heard a teacher once say that meek, uh, in scripture is defined like a big, powerful horse that's under control. Mm, okay. Yes. That's that, that, the the animal has become yes. controlled. Yes. So you don't lose your strength, but it's channeled in a productive way. Yeah. Cause the meek shall inherit yes. the earth. That sounds like. Pasty, the wimpy, the pasty, wimpy shall wimpy, inherit, yeah, yeah. Milk toasty kind of people. <laughs> the milk toast shall inherit the earth. Yeah, I, I don't think scripture, when it talks about humility or meekness, or even weakness, ta- is talking about wimpiness. There's strength in humility. In fact, if you want strength and if you want to be a confident person, first seek humility. And strength and confidence will be a byproduct. This is what we teach our students. Confidence is a byproduct of humility. But if you try to manufacture confidence as a thing in itself, that's what tends to go haywire. Mm-hmm. So gets you off track. How do you? How are you more humble? You know, I think humility comes with obedience. That okay. we come to the Scripture and we say, God, what are you saying to me this week? What are you saying to Ooh, me today? I like that. What do, What is going on right now, and how can I obey that? And the act of obedience, especially obedience of the heart. 
Sometimes you got to start with the obedience of the legs and hands and let it seep into the heart. But however that works, obedience eventually brings a good humility. Not this groveling servitude, but a powerful humility that serves Christ in the power of the Spirit. That's that's the humility I think we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. When you talk to students, graduate students and everyone else on campuses, does the, the topic of sin ever get asked? Yes, it does. And I'm maybe a little bit against the grain, some people who want to contextualize the word sin and use synonyms. Those synonyms are fine. My bottom line is whatever word you use, whether it's wrongdoing or sin or Miss the mark. Harm, miss the mark, whatever it is. Make mm-hmm. sure you explain yourself. I tend to use the word sin just because it's a historic word. The church has always used the word sin, but I always explain it. Here's what I mean by sin. That means falling short of what God has for us or doing the wrong thing or committing something that is evil in the sight of God. You know, whatever context we might be in, I'll explain it in those terms. But I actually like the word sin. It's a short, quick, easy to remember word. <laughs> it is that, yes, it has some baggage and connotations in our culture. I'm fine with that. Just explain what you mean and go on using it. So I think it's a super useful word. Same with me for the word evangelical. I know a lot of people have left that word behind in their vocabulary. I use the word all the time because I, what I mean by that is a historic Christian who holds to the creedal faith as going back to the early church. That's what I mean by that. And that gives me a chance to explain that. It's not just like a political label. So Mm -hmm. I tend to embrace these traditional words, but make sure I explain myself along the way. All right. We're going to take a break and come back. Rick Mattson is my guest, and he's got a 6 o'clock Bible study. So when we come back, you're going to have to talk fast. (laughs) All right? Because I don't want you to be too late. Let's do it. We still have lots more to talk about. Wonderful. We're talking about uh, answering the hard questions today. If you've been confronted by one and you just scratched your head and you didn't know what to do or what to say, we'd love to hear what it is. 877-933-2484. Welcome is a word said universally all over the world. Every language on the planet has their own way of making a friendly greeting. At Faith Radio, when we welcome, we really mean it. Learn more about us by requesting a free welcome pack gift. Text the word WELCOME to 877-933-2484 or visit MyFaithRadio.com to request your welcome pack today. And a warm welcome to you. I'm back with Rick Matson. We're talking about answering hard questions, and he has got quite a history of doing it. He's been with um, InterVarsity for a long time, his whole career, and he's answered a lot of questions. And way to go, Rick. Yeah, thank you. I heard a new one the other day, which doesn't happen often. Okay. How was the Trinity formed? Not the doctrine of the Trinity, but <laughs> how did God form the Trinity? Okay, I'd never been asked that yeah. before by a student at the University of Montana. So Yeah, and your answer was? <laughs> I wasn't formed. It just was. Okay. I am who I am. Okay, yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah, Rick has written a couple of books. The one that is very helpful is Faith is Like Skydiving and Other Memorable Images for Dialogue with Seekers and Skeptics. So give, give us an illustration from that book, Rick. Well, the title... Faith is like skydiving is a way for us to talk about the idea of faith as being very much informed faith, not blind faith. So if it's like skydiving, that means I would check out the pilot and the plane and the history of the company, the parachute and all the gear and the track record and all of that before I jumped out of the plane. And yet there is that moment where the, 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 the hatch doors are open and you actually jump out of the plane with no proof that you are going to land safely. So how might I describe faith to someone? It's informed faith. It's faith that's based on good reasons to believe. It's not blind faith, but it's still a little bit of a leap at some point without proof. Mm -hmm. So that should be easy for people to remember. Yeah, I like that. And let God do, let the Holy Spirit lead the conversation Mm -hmm. and do the work. It's it's his responsibility anyway. Yes, yes. And this always pushes me back to our theology of witness and apologetics that I've mentioned many times here on the air, and that is that God goes before us. He's doing his work in the lives of our friends who are not Christians. Our job isn't just to go in and preach. Our job is to go in and discern what he's already doing and participate in what in, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
That way, the onus is not on us. The burden is not on our shoulders. It's not up to us so much to carry the load here, to bring Jesus to people. We're discovering what Jesus is already doing in people, and that takes the pressure off, gets us out of salesmanship, gets us out of imposing our beliefs on others, and is sensitive to what God is doing. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a tough question, Rick Madsen. I'm attending a church. The campus pastor shows no leadership. It's a campus church where the sermons are over video. The pastor has allowed small groups to use teaching from someone who is known to have heretical teaching. Hmm. He puts... Excuse me. He puts very little into a small group he teaches. We've contemplated leaving and going elsewhere. Any advice? I'm a big fan of staying in a church for the long haul. There are exceptions to that. So an exception might be heretical teaching itself or long periods of neglect or or whatever in a church. Uh, Sharon and I have stayed at the same church for a long time through its ups and downs because we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We don't want to be consumers. Having said all that, sometimes it's just not the right place. Yeah. And over a long period of time, if leadership in that church has been neglected, well, then the flock is neglected, and then churches can fall into even deeper issues. So the critical question is, is this one of those kind of core DNA issues that over a long period of time might cause us to leave the church? Or is this, okay, this has been going on for six, eight months, 18 months or whatever, we're in this for the long haul. We're going to see this through. We're going to be part of the solution. Uh, I think that's the dividing line. And exactly where that line is, I mean, I'm kind of hesitant to speak further on it. But yeah. to me, that's the line. A- a- am I in this for the long haul and not a consumer Christian? And am I willing to be part of the, of the solution? And if I am, and if I've fulfilled all that, then maybe it's time to look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But if this is just a few months or a few weeks or a few minutes, then, hey— God calls us to a place through its ups and downs, and I think we need to be faithful there. That's interesting. I appreciate that perspective. Uh, Rick, talk about the symphony orchestra as a metaphor. Yeah. Well, the symphony orchestra means uh, play all of your instruments. So if I'm in a relationship and I happen to be good at apologetics, I'm going to use that. That's my trumpet section. Mm -hmm. If I'm good at hospitality, that's my violin section. If I'm good at... Um, planning and leadership. I'm going to maybe get people involved in some big project I'm doing. And that's another, that's the drums in my orchestra here. So playing all of your orchestra means using all of the instruments at your disposal. If your life is an orchestra, use everything at your disposal. It's listening, it's caregiving, it's empathy, it's apologetics, it's philosophy, it's theology, it's uh, service behind the scenes, whatever you're good at, whatever your whole, another metaphor is, whatever your toolbox is, use all of your tools. And all of those are fair game for witness. Uh, don't just be uh, one note Johnny or Susie here. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to wrap it up here in a minute, but I always like to kind of end where we started. And that is uh, the four things as we zoom out that we're going to pay attention to when we're starting Uh, to engage people in conversations about faith. What would be four things, because a lot of people just turned on the radio, climbed in the car, (laughs) got done working, and they have missed this. They can always go to the podcast and hear it from the beginning at myfaithradio.com. But seeing as how I have you here live and in person, Rick Madsen, tell me what those four are one more time. The four words are slow, listen, respond, and Jesus. So slow means slow down. We're in this for the long haul. This is a long conversation upcoming. Secondly, listen in stereo. Listen to what God is saying and listen to the person in front of you. Thirdly, respond directly to their question as best you can, yep. as well as you are equipped. Simple. Don't evade. And then fourthly, Jesus, that is, point them to Jesus. All of our apologetics, all of our witness eventually get back to the identity and teachings and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Really well done, Rick Matson. Thank you so much. And tell me the name of your other book as well, only because I'm having a moment here. I can't think of yeah. the name of it. Uh, Faith Unexpected That's is it. a book that you can actually give to your non-Christian friends because it's inspiring stories of faith. Yeah, Faith Unexpected. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being here. Have a lovely Bible study tonight. Yes, thank you. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to drive too far to get there. Ten minutes. Awesome. At most. All right. That's our show for the day. If you missed any of it, you can always... 
head over to MyFaithRadio.com. I had Ace Collins on in hour one, and we talked about the songs and hymns about heaven. It was wonderful. And Rick Madsen has been here this hour, and we have discussed answering hard questions and being prepared to uh, be involved in conversations to get yourself ready. All right, have a great evening. As you lay your head on the pillow tonight, know that God loves you. I do too, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.